very briefly, one of the very first things I think that permaculturists have been ignoring, it's like one of the number one principles in the designer's manual is to observe and imitate nature. Work with it rather than fight against it. And what this ties right into is the first protocol and the, our restoration ag protocol is know your biome. We've already talked about this. In order to observe and interact, you've got to know the difference between your observation and your concept. How many permaculturists are out there, they think that they're observing, and I'm going to pick on you, but it's not picking on you. She was uh, talking to him about um, product liability insurance. And she said, well, isn't that expensive? And that's expensive. Well, the word expensive is not a measurable concept. I mean, it's not a measurable phenomenon. You can't see, hear, taste, touch, measure, weigh with instruments, etc. whereas a cost of doing business, now what's the cost? If product liability insurance costs $1,000, now I put this into my design protocol, I plan, I act, I observe, evaluate, and adjust, and I figure out how to design my system to be able to incorporate that cost into it. I may then choose that I'm not going to carry this, or I'm going to do something different, or I'm going to upscale in order to be able to absorb this cost. But the word expensive immediately blocks you to thinking about how to solve the problem, and it puts you in a situation that's expensive I can't afford. It. that I think has had the most dynamic impact on the whole farm is the subsoiler and the different things that I've done through the years one was to have these big huge V things coming off just like I saw in those pretty cool pictures but what happened it ended up like riding on the surface and wouldn't cut down underneath and then uh, once upon a time I had uh, some car chain that I would bolt to that back here I tied it in a knot thinking it make some channels on the ground so the hook would go in and the, the ball of the chain would ride on the surface and it wouldn't go down in. Uh, when I first started pulling this it was with that tractor right there and it would only go in about this far <clears throat> and then year after year it goes in a little bit deeper a little bit deeper because it was such hard red clay whenever I'd finish a roll I'd have to scrape it off lift it up scrape it off with a flat pointed shovel and then nowadays it just drops in really easy. I cut as that hook and then we'll transplant right into that slot and then when the rain comes you know it goes in and infiltrates real quick and then the roots of the plants get you know this beautiful crumbly soil to just dive right down into and we've converted the soil here from red clay to that this gray stuff that kind of resembles topsoil in 20 years. What, what was the horsepower of that original? In 1945, it was a 19 horse tractor. 19 horse. You know, this, this is actually designed for two horses. Okay. Let's just explain what I did. We did the same thing. This, was, uh, this had, the, by the second year we were here when we put in the asparagus, the, uh, the grasses had grown back to rank weeds and grasses, so it wasn't. This is a really beautiful sod compared to what it was. It was it was crap. You see, like a lot of this uh, spotty, like super overgrazed, hard, the clumps of bare dirt, the thistles. Uh, when my boys were little, they said, "Oh, we ought to name the farm Quack Thistle Farm." <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> so what we did is we went out with the two bottom plow. We uh, well we all right. I took some classes on asparagus. I learned about all the do 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 do. And one of the things that I learned that I figured that I'd kind of average out uh, the both of them. The asparagus that will last the longest and produce the most, most pounds per crown is when it was planted six feet apart evenly. Each crown produced more asparagus than any other planting configuration when it was six foot apart. That was the most asparagus per crown. Correct. However, when you plant asparagus every 18 inches, in a row, and rows 18 inches apart, you got the most asparagus in the early years, and the total yield per acre was more than what you would have got on a on a 30-year patch. You would get more total yield off the 18-inch spacing, but it would peter out before 30 years. It peter out in 20, 25 years, but the the, the finances on it 
was you'd get your return in the early years real quick because you had a high density, you could really harvest the whole bunch. And so what I kind of did, I scratched my head and said, well, why don't I go halfway in between? I'm not going to be chemically growing this stuff, and I'm not going to be doing the, you know, the Elliott Coleman taking care of it. I'm not going to dig a two-foot deep trench, put horse manure in it and let it rot for two years, and then turn it in with the right minerals and bone meal, and finally three years from now, put it in and bury it one inch per week as it grows, still comes out, keep it bare soil and mulch. You know, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to imitate what's going on on the side of the road, so we, we laid these rows out six feet apart, dropped the furrow in the ground with the two-bottom plow, and then put the crowns in almost touching, like just touching right on top of each other. And then come back with a back blade and just flip the sods back over, put them right into the pasture. We did this patch first one year, and then it came up the next year. We went and did the second, third, and fourth patch. Well, because of the workload, I knew that we were going to be doing all of our spring work, the field tillage, and remember at that time I'm doing like 10, 12, 14 acres of produce. So it was like a lot of field prep work in the springtime. And so I got the last truck coming out of uh, uh, New Jersey, we got it all from the Jersey asparagus farms, which is now the Walker plant farm. And um, so by the time we went to put the asparagus in the ground, we were like three, four weeks with no rain. So we plowed the furrows in the ground, flipped all the sods over, put the asparagus in the ground, flipped it all back, and it never rained again until December. And the asparagus never came out of the ground. And I knew that we're, that's it, we're done, we're toast. It's just a total loss. Well, then next spring, there's these little teeny tiny asparagus that's coming up like about this big, at like pencil, thinner than a pencil lead someplace. Only that big. And the grass comes up and does this jungle stuff. It's like, well, let's give it a chance. You know, I mean, it's not, I'm not doing anything to it. It's not really costing me anything other than the fact that we already had a total loss. I'm busy enough doing everything. Two little kids building the house, taking your animals, moving fence, driving truck, doing all the produce. I got enough things to worry about. I'm not going to pay attention to this asparagus. Third season, there's an asparagus patch there. Mm -hmm. So wow, unbelievable. It right? would have been the first. <coughs> one, two, yeah, the third season. So it, it spent the whole year, never came out of the ground. Never came out of the ground. So then what we do is I'll wait. You're supposed to mow all the ferns in the fall so you don't encourage disease, fungal disease. I, I left it standing because in the early years, if you imagine, I mean, this was, this was open, wide open. And there was nothing to stop the snow. You know, North Pole to here is a straight line all the way across Saskatchewan, Alberta, Manitoba, Minnesota. <laughs> Now there's this asparagus patch with these ferns up here, and sometimes you see the snow going along like this, and there's the asparagus patch, and it goes down again. The ferns and the swales and the, the tall vegetation were catching all that snow that was blowing in from, from next door. And who knows where it was coming from. And so then in the spring, when the ground is uh, not frozen, not thawed but greasy wet, Thawed, cold, and firm. I'll go out and I'll scalp mow it. And so it's not like you just asked about the mowing. When I mowed it, who asked that? You did. So that it'll be. It'll, it's it's a time. It's a timing thing. Right. All of a sudden, now is the time because then I know that the asparagus isn't moving yet, and I'll just clip everything right off. So I'm even mowing dirt sometimes. Is the grass mowing? Well, I was just wondering how you got it. Keep the grass low because the grass is definitely lower there. So then what happens is we'll go pick it. And you pick it and pick it and you pick it till I can't see it anymore, then you scalp mow it. So that patch has been mowed twice this year. That's all it's ever gonna get. It's the only care we ever put into it, that harvested. So you know, no more horse manure, mulch, pile this, weed free, that, and you know, blah blah. Two mowing. One for the sun. Pardon? First mowing yeah, Right. The first, the first mowing is to get rid of the ferns from last year. You have to expose the soil and warms up quicker. We get a quicker flush in the spring. Then the second one is so we can actually find asparagus again. But by now, you think about it, we mowed this what, two weeks ago, a week and a half ago. Uh, the soil moisture, the spring moisture is kind of gone. The grass has already been harassed twice. The asparagus naturally wants to grow taller anyway. If we get the head of the grass, we win. And this is how we received information from Mark Shepard. Right there on New Forest Farm in Biola, Wisconsin. Participating in a restoration agriculture design course. 
from teachers who are actually on the ground and work in the soil. Seven whole days. It's a lot to consider. And I'll have more next week. Thanks a lot for watching. This is a tool that I think has had the most dynamic impact on the whole farm. It's the subsoiler.